Well, good morning. Everybody doing okay? Good. I'm excited to be here this morning. Before I get started, though, I want to do a few thank yous. Um, and just so you know, I'm really fighting with my mic here, so if I'm wrestling up here, just ignore that. Um, it's winning so far, so. But I want to thank Pastor Don for just coming in and really being with us as, as, you know, Hope Church, as a church family, just walking us through these last several months, walking us through the holidays from a ministry standpoint. Holidays are very busy, challenging times, and so for Pastor John to come in and kind of walk us through that, very appreciative of him. Um, the board, uh, for just giving me the opportunity to come up here. It's been three years since I've stood on this stage and preached to you, and so I'm very thankful for them for giving me the opportunity to preach. Uh, to the Hope staff, who have just been amazing over this last year, um, bless me, bless my family, um, and just thankful for them. And then finally, thankful to all of you, whether you're here live or whether you're online, Thank you for just your faithfulness. Um, I know it's been a challenging year, watching from home, online, coming in with masks, being socially distanced, all of those things. But at the end of the day, you're still here. You're still faithful. You're still a part. You are who the church is. Hope Church isn't this building. Hope Church is you. And the fact that you're still here is a huge testament, not only to your faithfulness, but to God working in and through you. So I'm thankful for that. So for some of you, you have no idea who I am. I have on my headline, who is this joker? So for those who don't know who I am, I am Pastor Brandon Party Cooper. Um, I have been in ministry for about 20-ish years, somewhere around, somewhere around there. I've done everything in the church except for kids pastor and lead pastor. I have a great deal of respect for Christine because every opportunity that I had to be a kids pastor, I said, you really just don't want me in that role. I'm doing you a favor, and so, um, so I've, I've not done Kids Pastor, but I've been everything from the janitor to office administration and everything else in between. And so some things I was really good at, other things not so much. Um, most recently, I served here uh, at uh, Hope Church as the executive pastor, all up until 2018. And in 2018, I decided to step away um, and start a consulting company where I work with pastors and ministry leaders all over the country, really just kind of helping them grow their church and quite honestly, take care of themselves. Because how many of you know pastors and ministry leaders, uh, they struggle at times with all of the weight that ministry can be and all the challenges that come with it. And as many of you are, we as pastors don't always take care of ourselves. And so um, what I try to do is help pastors do that, take care of themselves, grow, grow their church and love their people. So um, my better half, Carissa, is here uh, as well. She is a physician assistant in the area and helps raise our three wonderful boys Aiden, who is seven, Isaiah, who is four, and then Emerson, who will be two in June, which is, I can't even believe it. Um, so, two years old, and he is the only one, my wife and I have incredibly curly hair, and for some reason, our third child is the only one with curly hair, um, and it's really curly, and so uh, I cry every time we have to cut those locks off. So, I want to start this morning by asking you a question. And the question is, are you successful? Now, I know that that is somewhat of an awkward question to ask, especially in church. We don't really talk, like talking about success. We like this idea that we come in and we're just all middle-of-the-road average people. We don't compare our success to other people's success. Some of us in this room, we may, when I ask that question, we may inside raise our hand and jump up real high and say, yeah, I'm successful. I'm successful. Maybe there's some metric that you've used to measure your success. Maybe, you, maybe you've reached some financial peak or uh, maybe you have the family that you always imagined having and you feel like you're successful. Maybe you've purchased that home that just is exactly what you've always wanted and so you, you would say, yeah, I'm successful. Others of us in this room, we may maybe bow our heads a little bit or hold our head down in shame and say, no, I'm really I'm really not successful. Maybe, uh, maybe even to the degree of, as you look over your life, you say, maybe I had a chance to be successful, but I missed it, I squandered it, or I didn't do what I should have with it. And so, no, I'm not successful. The problem with success, though, is that there is no universal metric that we can use to measure success. How you feel successful may not be what other people would consider successful. 
And so the problem is, is that when I ask the question, are you successful, there are a million answers to that question because we all measure success a little bit differently. However, all of us in this room, I'm assuming, have a desire to be successful followers of Jesus Christ, correct? That's really the heart of who we are. Whether, whatever, whatever, whatever cultural or societal uh, measurement that we may have, at the end of the day, we all want to be successful followers of Jesus Christ. And a lot of us would forego any worldly success that may come to us in order to be successful followers of Jesus, successful in the kingdom of God. Most of us in this room would say that. But even still, how do we measure success as followers of Jesus Christ? What metric do we use? Is it, is it in the hours that we pray? Are you successful because you pray X amount of hours? Is it, is it in the number of people you serve? Well, I preach to millions, so am I more successful than you? Is it in, the, is it in how much of the Bible that you've memorized? If you've memorized the whole Bible, are you more successful than those who haven't? How do we know whether or not we are successful followers of Jesus Christ? And you see, the thing is, is what has happened over this last year is that the question of what is a successful follower of Jesus or even what is a successful church has become very muddled. It's become very confusing how we would measure Success following Jesus. Over this last year, we've learned a lot about the American church in particular. We've learned that uh, we've learned that politics is informing our relationship with Jesus a little bit more than maybe it should. When we look across America and we look at who we are as Big C Church, we learn that we're a little bit more afraid of our of losing our rights than we are discipling each other. We've learned that we aren't quite as flexible and as adaptable as we would like to think we are. Right? We all like to think that we can just roll with the punches. But that's hard to do. One of the most disturbing things that we've learned over this last year, when I'm talking about big C church across the American uh, nation, we've learned that we don't know our Bible as well as we would like to think we do. As I said, I work with pastors all across the country, and what we have watched over this last year is that when we removed Sunday morning services and we moved to online, and many people, especially at the beginning, were not coming or uh, were having trouble with the technical pieces or whatever, what we discovered is that a lot of them did not know their scriptures. They did not know their Bible. And so, with all of that in mind, are we successful are you successful because the question is if we don't know our scriptures then how in the world are we going to know whether or not we are successful followers of jesus christ so my goal over these next few weeks is to tackle that question is to get into the word to get into scripture to look at jesus to look at the early church, to look and see how did they measure success as followers of Jesus Christ. So with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of our Bibles, we are going to dive in and really ask the question, am I successful according to Scripture and what Jesus calls us, you and me, to be? So let me change my question and ask, Who's ready to be successful? Good, good. Because I was really not sure what to do if nobody said anything. <laughs> Last week we celebrated Easter. We had a wonderful sermon by Pastor Don. Hopefully you had a wonderful dinner with your family. We had ham. I love ham. We have lots and lots of it left over. The ham that never went away. 
On Easter Sunday, it is one of the top three attended services in all of the calendar. Christmas, Easter, and Mother's Day are the three top. People come out of the woodwork to come to an Easter service because, well, there's a variety of reasons, but mainly because of the significance that the Easter service provides. Because Easter is when we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, correct? But how many of you know that when Jesus rose from the grave, on that morning moment, the disciples had no idea what was going on. You and I have the benefit of retrospect, and we can look back, and we can look in our Bible and look at our scriptures, and we can understand the significance of that moment. But how many of you know the disciples had no idea? But it wasn't because they weren't told. It was because they didn't pay attention. It was because they didn't listen. In fact, Jesus told them on at least four occasions. If you look in Matthew 16, 21, it says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. In Matthew 17, 1 through 13, this is when Peter, James, and John, they go up with Jesus up to the mountain, and, and this is where Jesus is transfigured right before them. And they have this moment with Jesus in his transfigured form, along with Elijah and Moses. Now, how many of you, if you were Peter, James, and John, and you were in this moment, how many of you would be paying a lot of attention, right? And so as this event, this moment passes, and Peter, James, and John, and Jesus begin to descend down the mountain, Jesus says, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Did they miss it? Shortly after, in Matthew 17, 22, and 23, this is after the demons were unable to heal a demon-possessed boy. Jesus says to them, The Son of Man is not about to be delivered, or the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And scripture says, and they were greatly distressed, and this is important. This is important because the fact that they're greatly distressed shows what they were paying attention to. They were paying attention to Jesus was about to die, not paying attention to that he was about to be raised from the dead. They were greatly distressed. They weren't paying attention. And then finally, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem, and he says to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. How many of you think Jesus got the message out? Do you think Jesus is pretty clear on what they should expect on that first Resurrection Sunday? I don't know about you, but how many of you, if you've been told four times by Jesus, hey guys, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to raise three days later. How many of you would be at the tomb on the third day, you'd have your coffee, you'd have your breakfast burrito, and you'd have your camera ready for the moment, right? Like you would be ready because you were told you were ready and you were there. Where were the disciples? Hiding. They were hiding they were afraid, they were disenfranchised, they had no idea what to do. No idea. The problem is, is that even though they'd spent three years with Jesus, and even though they had, he had taught them and discipled them, the problem is, is the entire time they had been on their own path, not the path that Jesus had laid out for them. So the question is, is what is the path? You see, for three years, Jesus invested his time 
into these 12 men. Now, there were hundreds and even thousands at times that came and were a part and were there. But Jesus chose, hand-picked, 12 men, right? And for three years, those 12 men walked with him. They learned from him. They camped out with him. They did miracles with him. They, they, did, every, they did life with him. They spent more time with him than most of us ever have spent with our best friend. These 12 men walked with Jesus. Now, something to understand is that in the first century, having a disciple or being a disciple was a normal thing. In fact, every young boy dreamed of being a disciple of someone. It's kind of like today. We have all of our, our athletes and we have our, um, we have our you know, music stars and, and actors and actresses and all these people that we look up to, we value. You know, we think, man, if I could just have 10 minutes with that person. If I could just meet that person. Well, imagine first century Jewish boys, that's what they imagined. All these rabbis running around Jerusalem and they imagined following one of them, being a disciple. And the problem is when they reach 13, 14 years old, somewhere around there, the ones who were smart enough or rich enough got chosen to be disciples. And if you didn't get chosen, then you went into a trade school, went into an apprenticeship, and usually you worked for the benefit of your family. And so when Jesus comes along and he handpicks these 12 men, number one, most of them were older than they should have been to be a disciple. They were in their late teens. And number two, they had already been passed over, every single one of them, because all of them were tradesmen. They had been overlooked and not chosen. They weren't wealthy enough and they weren't smart enough. And Jesus chose them anyway. In fact, I guarantee you there were smarter people, smarter young boys, smarter teenagers, and more wealthy people that Jesus could have chosen. Quite honestly, there were probably more influential people that Jesus could have chosen. But he didn't. He chose these 12. These 12 men to follow and be his disciples. So don't you think if you had been overlooked by every other rabbi, and Jesus came along and handpicked you, don't you think you would pay a lot more attention to what he was teaching, to how he's guiding, what he was doing? Because all along, for three years, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about how the kingdom of God works and how it functions. He's teaching them about how love is the currency of God's kingdom, about how pious religion is not righteousness. And you know what those 12 men were imagining? What they were looking for? They were looking for a nationalistic revolt. That's what they were looking for. So I mentioned I have three boys. And my house is constantly guns and swords and wrestling and superheroes and fighting bad guys. How many of you have boys? How many of you, amen? Right? Well, I don't imagine that first century boys were that much different. And as these 12 men were boys, I would imagine that they had some pretty active imaginations about what they imagined things to be as they grew up. Because these boys, they would have heard stories about King David and all of his great conquerings. They would have heard of King Solomon and the greatness of Israel at that time. They would have heard of the Maccabean Revolt in 167 B.C. How the, how, how the, the Israelites rose up and, and fought off the, the Seleucids and gained their freedom. And Israel was a nation once again. All up until Rome came in and, and ruined the party. They grew up hearing those stories. And I guarantee you they played them out. They got their wooden swords and they imagined themselves fighting off the Roman guards. Remember, there are Roman soldiers wandering the city all the time. And I can imagine my seven-year-old Aiden with his foam sword, with a nationalistic, patriotic heart inside of him, imagining that he's going to overthrow and attack those Roman guards. 
That's how the disciples view it. And those boys grew up to be men who followed Jesus, who was a great leader and a great rabbi. And they imagined that they would overthrow Rome. They imagined that Israel would rise again and Jesus was going to lead them there. They walked around like this spiritual pack, doing miracles and healing people and, and, and saving people's lives. And, and Jesus was just making things happen and the disciples were right there with him. So imagine how that plays into the narrative that they're living out. But did Jesus ever talk about that? Did Jesus ever talk about overthrowing the Romans? Did he ever talk about establishing a new kingdom here on earth? No. The disciples created their own path. Even though Jesus never nudged them that direction, no, never really talked about that, they created a path outside of what Jesus was walking so that's why when Jesus dies on the cross, they're not ready at the tomb for his resurrection. They're not ready for three days later he rises again. They're not ready for that because they're not on the path that Jesus had put them on. They were on their own path. And there's two moments that I want to I focus on real quick. And they're both in Luke chapter 24. And the first moment is when, right after the resurrection. So the resurrection happens, Mary and the, la and, and the women, they go back, they tell the disciples, Jesus rose, Peter and John, they run and they find the tomb empty, but they don't see Jesus the way Mary does. And so we pick up here in Luke 24, we have these two men who are walking to Emmaus. Emmaus is, um, it is seven and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem, and Again, keep in mind, they're walking, no cars, they're not riding their bikes, they're walking seven and a half miles to Emmaus. And as they're walking, it says that Jesus draws near to them, but they're unable to, to recognize him. For whatever reason, Jesus is, you know, he's in spy mode, and so they don't know that it's Jesus. And he asks them what they're talking about, and they're talking about the events of Jesus and, and everything that has happened over the last few days, and him dying and being crucified and everything else. And I want to pick it up in verse 19. In verse 19 it says, And he said to them, What thing? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed, and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped, and this is where, this is where you got to pay attention. Pay attention to the, almost the, the, angst and the frustration and the, almost the confusion that they're in. It says, um, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had, been, they, they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So, so you kind of get the sense. They're trying to make sense out of what, everything that's going on. Not only are they dealing with, dealing with the disappointment that Jesus died, and for whatever reason they're forgetting that he's supposed to rise again, but now they have all of these confusing reports. The, the tomb is empty. Angels are there. You know, Jesus wasn't seen which Mary said that she had seen him, but apparently they either didn't get the memo or they're ignoring that fact because, I mean, the women said they saw him, but are we going to listen to the women? Right? I mean, that's, that's the feeling we get here. Mary saw them, but uh, Peter and John didn't see him, so we're going to go with Peter and John. There's just a lot of confusing things going on here. And you sense that from these two men. And then Jesus, 
Jesus is such a good teacher, and he's such a good coach, and he loves his disciples so much, he responds, Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Because Jesus knows. He has told them what to expect. And they are bewildered by the events that are unfolding. Exactly how he said they would. They're on their own path. And then he goes on and he unpacks. Once again, he disciples his disciples. He unpacks the scriptures again pointing to everything that talked about what would happen. And then, and then the men, as they're walking to Emmaus, they get to Emmaus and um, you know, they invite Jesus in because it's late in the day. Uh, so they invite him in go, to have, have dinner and stay the night. They're at the table. Jesus breaks the bread, blesses it. And that's when, miraculously, they then realize it's Jesus. And then somehow Jesus vanishes. Scripture says he just disappears. He's just gone. Like, oh my goodness, it's Jesus. And he's gone. And so what do these men do? They, they get up. Again, Emmaus is seven and a half miles from Jerusalem. They get up and, and they, it, Scripture says they, they go back to Jerusalem to see the other disciples. Now, seven and a half miles is a long way. Right? I mean, how, how long would it take you to go seven and a half miles? Like, if you're in really good shape, which maybe these young, spry, you know, powerful disciples, maybe they were able to run the seven and a half miles, it would take them an hour. Most of us walking, it would take between, you know, an hour to two hours. If you're me, and you're huffing and puffing halfway through, and you're taking lots of breaks at the bench along the way, you're looking at a three or four half four hour trip. But Jesus just vanished. So what do you you're not gonna say, oh, we need to tell the disciples about that in the morning and go to bed. You're gonna get up and you're gonna go to Jerusalem. So seven and a half miles back to Jerusalem, and they, they go to the other disciples and say, We just saw Jesus, they tell the entire story to them. And while they're tell, telling the story, scripture says that Jesus just appears in the room. Not that he snuck in and nobody paid attention. Not that somehow he was already there and nobody saw him. Or that he knocked on the door and said, hey guys. No. Scripture says he appears in the room. And he says, peace to you. Peace be with you. Which in Hebrew is shalom. And ironically, when he says peace be to you or peace be with you, it scares them to death. Because he just appears out of nowhere. And then it gets real serious. Because Jesus knows the disciples have been on their own path. And he knows that the three years that he just spent with them has not gotten them on the right path. So he begins to disciple them again. He begins to teach them, he begins to show them, he begins to once again walk them through what the prophets and Moses and the Psalms and everybody else said, what he said. And he helps them understand, you're on the wrong path. The question is, for all of us, would you have missed it? Would I have missed it? If Jesus had told me that he was going to die and rise again three days later, would I have missed it? Would you have missed it? Because it's easy for us to look and say, man, what is with those disciples? Like, seriously, Jesus told you and you missed it. It's easy for us to take that stance. But let me ask you this. How many times has Jesus told you the same thing over and over and over again? And you're still on your own path. You're still creating the path that kind of looks like Jesus' path, but it's yours. That's the un unfortunate part about the question. 
Because none of us want to admit that we would be on our own path. I don't want to admit that. I'm a pastor. I, I can't be on my own path. But the reality is, is I get on my own path sometimes too. All of us do. See, Jesus came to this earth for two reasons. Two reasons. Primarily, two reasons. The first is to go to the cross, redeem mankind of our sins, and create a bridge back to God the Father. That's the first reason he came. The second reason he came was to disciple these 12 men who would then turn around with the help of the Holy Spirit and change the world. He came to create a culture shift within the nation of Israel that would permeate to the outer parts of the world. It would bring the saving gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. Those are the two reasons he came. Yet after all of that, his disciples are walking their own path. So he came to die on the cross and redeem mankind. Check. He came to disciple 12 men so they could change the world. Nah, not quite there. And he's already died. And he's getting ready to ascend. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples. And scripture doesn't tell us a lot about what's going on in those 40 days, but you want to know what I think he's doing? He's discipling them all over again. Because they were looking for a conquering king, even though he never said that's what he would do. They were looking for it. They were waiting for it. And when he died... Their hope went out the door. And so for 40 days, Jesus is discipling them all over again. And he's shifting their perspective from the path that they had created to the path that he had been trying to get them on. So I come back to our original question. Are you successful? Do you want to be successful? One thing that I've learned in all of my studies and all of my experience as a leader and, and all the things that I've learned. How many of you are, are gardeners here? Any of you gardeners? Okay, how many of you are golfers? No golfers? Just a couple. Wow, that, there we go. There we go. <laughs> how many of you, I'm trying to think. How many of you work on cars? A few of us. How many of you are hunters? Okay. How many of you do woodworking? You see, the thing is, is whatever you choose to learn, whatever you choose to follow, there, especially now, there's a million voices on how to do it, right? And you can learn it this way, or you can learn it this way, or you can learn it this way. And the problem is, is all, what we try to do is we try to learn it from all of these different ways. And what it, what, it inevitably be do, what it inevitably does to us is it slows down the growth process, right? Because we, we go down this path a little ways, and then we're like, oh, but this looks li a lot better. So then we go down this path a little ways, and then, oh, we're, and, and we just kind of get schizophrenic on how we're learning. We choose all these different paths, and we try to walk a few steps on each path. Whereas if we would have just committed to one path, and stayed committed to it, we would get where we would be the master gardener a lot faster because we stayed on one path, right? So if you want to be successful in anything, but in today's context, if you want to be a successful follower of Jesus Christ, you have to commit to one path. And that's the path that Jesus has laid out for us. Because there's this little thing hanging out there called the Great Commission. It's Jesus' final words before he ascends, before he, he leaves his disciples. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus gives the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is the path that he has given us. This is the path 
but he's called us to walk. Every other path is our own. Now, there are nuances in Jesus' path. But at the end of the day, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the path. And as we've learned over this last year, there is too much of God's church not on the path. And so the question that we have to, to wrestle with this morning, are you on that path? Are we, as Hope Church, on that path? Are we, are we wanting to do what we need to to get on the path? To glorify Jesus, to bring his word to the outermost parts of the earth. Because everything else is details. Everything else is the, the fringe part of the message. Because at the end, if we're not on this path, then something is amiss. And we need to deal with it. I know for me, it's easy for me to kind of get veered off. I, I, you know, there's a part of me, I would much rather deal with leadership dynamics and organizational st structures and systems. Like, that's my wheelhouse. I'm not the great evangelist, for sure. And even discipleship and discipling others is not always my first go-to. Because it's hard to stay on Jesus' path sometimes. We like what we like. We like our comforts and we like our conveniences. Quite honestly, we like being in charge. We don't always like it when Jesus is in charge. I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning. Now, there are those of us in this room who um, we are on the path. Or at least we think we're on the path. And what I would encourage you to do is if you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm on that path. I'm, I'm walking with Jesus. I'm, him and I are good. We're, I'm where I should be. Great. Because I think there are some of us in this room, we are there. But my challenge to you is, is ask that question every day. Every day, ask the question, God, am I where I should be? Jesus, am I on the path that you set me? Because even one degree off becomes million miles away in a short period of time. So, so if you're here this morning, you're saying, hey, I'm on that path. I'm right where I need to be. Great. We need more people like that. But don't assume because you're on the path today or yesterday that you're still there today or you will be tomorrow. That's a constant check with God. A constant moment with Jesus every day. Jesus, am I still on the path? And if not, can help me get where I need to be. So that's my challenge to you this morning as we open the altars in a few minutes. If you need to ask that question, if you need to get with Jesus and ask, then do that. If you're in this room and you're saying, there's no question, I know I'm off the path. I know that I'm not where I should be. And there's a million reasons why that is. Maybe you're in full-on rebellion from God and may, or maybe you're just so busy Well, you know, the great thing about that is, is that Jesus is full of grace and mercy and forgiveness. It doesn't matter how far off the path you are, Jesus will always bring you back. No questions asked. However, you have to ask him and you have to submit to him in order for that to happen. You have to say, Jesus the Lord of my life, and I surrender to your path. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray, and Josh is going to play, and the altars are going to be open, and if you say, I need to check in with Jesus and make sure I'm still on the path, then I want to invite you to respond to that. So if you can get with Jesus, even just for a few minutes, and ask.
ask Jesus, am I where I should be? And at the same time, if you're saying, I'm absolutely not where I should be, but I want to be on the path that Jesus wants me on, I want to invite you as well to come. Don't be afraid of Jesus because he is full of love and forgiveness. He just asks you to come. That's it. I'm going to pray. Josh is going to play, and I want to invite you to come to the altar. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you, God, for your incredible patience, love, and forgiveness. Because even though it's easy for us to look at the disciples and and wonder how in the world they missed it, God, we miss it a lot of times. And so I pray this morning, in this moment, in this room, your presence full and your presence moves in our hearts. God, some of us, we are so far off the path that we're not even sure where the path is anymore. And God, we may be apprehensive, we may be uncertain how to come to you or whether or not we even want to. But Lord, I pray that you will wrap your arms around us this morning and give us the comfort that we need to know that we can come to you because you are full of forgiveness. God, for those of us who are in this room, we feel like we are right where we should be. That we are on the path. God, I pray that you will guard us. Guard us from pride and arrogance. Guard us from religiosity. Guard us from the things that it's so easy for us to fall into. Forgive us if we are off the path. Reveal to us how we got off the path. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you will restore us not just today, but every day, that we will come to you daily and ask, Jesus, am I where I should be? Move God in this place. Move God in these next few moments. Be Lord of our lives and have your way with us.